Hi, hi, this is Crystal Combs and we're here at the Evo Entertainment Center this evening with Anthony Michael Hall. I keep wanting to call you Michael Anthony Hall. I think because I was born in 78, that's how I remember it, but... You know what, you're right on the money because actually that is my given name. So when I joined the union as a kid actor, there was an actor named Michael Hall and a Michael Anthony, so I had to kind of flip it. So that's actually my given name. So it's funny you said that, but anyway, yeah, this is great to be with you. Thank you for having this interview. Yeah, and we so appreciate you having the time to sit down with us today. Uh, we were just talking with my daughter who's running the camera on the other side uh, about the fact that she was mixing uh, parts of The Breakfast Club. They're working on editing that right now, and that's actually the film you're showing here today. It's amazing. Like you were saying, your daughter's in an art school here in San Antonio, and that was part of her curriculum to kind of do a mashup and kind of intercut some other films from you know, sort of the millennial generation. That's awesome. So, you know, it's just a testament to John Hughes. He was such an incredible guy to work with, such a great artist. But one of his talents, Crystal, was just like beyond the scripts. He was a great collaborator. He kind of empowered us all to improvise and do different things. He was just a great guy to work with. That's really cool, you know, to see your daughter doing her thing. And, and that's a great thing, too, with a testament to the film, because I think it's something that keeps finding in younger generations, which is really impressive. So. It's really cool. Yes, it is amazing how it's spanned uh, the test of time. I mean, this is like the 35th anniversary, I believe. It's amazing. You know, we made this movie back in 1984, I believe, and it was just a small budget. It was about $8 million at the time. You know, we felt like we were filming a play, but I think the message is what's most important. It's really a deconstruction of stereotypes, right? And that, you know, whether it's young kids watching it or people our age, the message is clear. You know, we're more alike than we are different. So it's a beautiful film. You know? yeah, I'm really proud of it. So I have a question. In the beginning scenes of the movie where everyone's kind of fidgeting before everyone bonds and, and gets to know each other and, you know, uh, Ali Sheedy is spinning the string around her finger, was that written into the script or was that ad-libbed? That's a great question. I actually cannot recall, I have to admit. But you know what? It's really interesting, too, because I think with that behavior, maybe that was John's way of establishing something for the audience to identify them with. So that's a great question. I actually can't recall. I have to go back and find the script. Your mom stumped me there. <laughs> oh, well, good. I think that it really humanized the characters. And I was trying to figure out when I was watching the movie again last night before, you know, prepping to, to speak with you today, um, why do you think they took on the character of the bad boys so early on and covered for him, uh, like when he fell through the ceiling? Why do you think that is? That's a very interesting question. I have literally never thought about that. Your mom is like the best. That's a great question. In the moment, I would say it probably had something to do with John Hughes wanting to set up the fact that we wanted to have empathy for him ultimately, because right, right. he was sort of the first to lash out and be sort of a you know uh, emotional kind of mean character in a sense. But ultimately, what John is great at is he gets to the heart of it. By the end of the film, right, we connect in ways and kind of unpeel each other, you know. And I think that's a great thing about the film. It's a great question. Probably maybe had something to do with that for John. Maybe he wanted to set up the guy that had seemed like the bully as. You know, to have an arc maybe later in the story. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I love the film. Um, and so currently, I know you're working on a new film that's coming out in 2020, and that's Halloween Kills. Yes, ma'am. So we shot it in la uh, last September and October in Wilmington, North Carolina, and it was a great experience. Um, I met with David Gordon Green last summer in LA, and then I did a screen test, and I was just really, you know, blessed and fortunate to get the job. And it was a great experience. We shot for about six weeks. And, uh, you know, to work with Danny McBride, who's, I'm a big fan of his, and David Gordon as well. It's a great experience. Another thing that was really impressive is they had a core group in their crew, guys that they actually went to film school in South Carolina, you know, 20 years ago. And uh, they're very loyal guys, they're very tight knit, and uh, it was a great experience, you know. Yeah, really enjoyed it. And so the part that you're playing in the film, um I looked it up a little bit, but it, I believe it was Tommy Doyle is the part you're playing. Yeah. And that was one of the children in the original film that Jamie Lee Curtis was in. Yeah. That was, they, they were getting, yeah. they were the kids that were getting babysat by her, exactly. correct? Exactly. And I'm old enough to remember that. I mean, here I am at 51. I remember watching that, I think it was on Showtime as a kid. And so one of the things that's great that David Gordon Green and Danny McBride did is they brought the original cast back for this next installment. And uh, I can't say much more than that, but it's, there's a lot of great surprises. I think it was great, too, because first of all, it was very respectable that he incorporated all those actors. Yeah. And at the same time, he's sort of reinventing the mythology of it based on you know, the original cast, which I think was also a really nice touch. And they were all wonderful, really nice people, and uh, we had a great time shooting them. Yeah. So now that you're going to be a part of the cult following that is Halloween, uh, you're going to be doing a lot more of these uh, cons, I imagine. Yeah. 
And I love that. You know, I started doing Comic Cons back when I was doing the Dead Zone, the early 2000s. And I just really loved and fell in love with the experience. It's a really interactive thing. It's a very family-friendly thing. Um, and I just really enjoyed doing it. And that sort of gave me the idea of, of partnering with Evo Entertainment and doing this, um, as well as other theater owners, because we wanted to kind of pay tribute to John Hughes, have a movie experience for fans. Uh, at the same time, the live Q&A is really fun, because I can have fun and get up on stage and answer questions for fans and kind of talking about the origins of stuff. So it's really wonderful. It's been a great thing. You know? Yeah. Well, that is wonderful. And so I think the thing that the kids at my daughter's school wanted me to ask you was, yeah. How did you get your start as an actor? And, you know, because you were 16, I believe, when you were filming uh, The Breakfast Club. And do you have any advice for them as far as longevity? Uh, because you've had such a hugely sex successful career. Right. Thank you for that. Well, I did start as a boy. I actually started way before that. In the mid 70s, I did a play with Steve Allen. So I've been in the business for about four decades. And I just feel very grateful. The good Lord's blessed me with a creative life and I'm, I'm really grateful for it. In terms of advice, you know, there's that old saying, Crystal, which I'm sure you've heard, which is, you know, if you do something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So what I would, you know, encourage the younger generations to do is to really find your passion, you know, be committed to it, and stick with, uh, you know, the basics. My father used to say something to me growing up, which was, uh, keep it simple, you know, and by that I think he meant focus on what's important, you know, your family, your objectives, what you're trying to do, and, you know, continue and stick to your craft, whatever it is that you choose to do, and do it to the best of your ability, you know? And I think, um, as the old saying goes, you know, if you do something you love, you never work a day in your life. But at the same time, if you're passionate about it, the money will come. And I think in our country, we're often fixated on money and earning a living, and, and that's all good and fun, it's important. But do something that you love and do it to the best of your ability. And, you know, work from the mindset of making a contribution, you know? And you have to have the long view in mind as well, I would say. Wow, that's incredible advice, and I think that uh, we'll end on that note. And I really appreciate this moment with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>